Welcome to the Cloud Accounting Podcast. I'm Blake Oliver. And I'm David Leary. I'm Kenji Kuramoto. Thanks for joining us, Kenji. It's great to have you here at the Accounting Salon, year two. Year number two. In New Orleans. Great to be here with you guys. Face to face. Face to face. It is It is a little daunting for me. I listen to you guys every week. And I always hear you talk about how um, you're never together and you're actually both here in front of me uh, and that you, David, are usually in your closet. And it was fun being at lunch today hearing your son confirm that, yes, dad actually goes into the closet and, and and actually, you know, records the Cloud Accounting Podcast. It's a professional studio. It's not a closet. It sounds very good. You may need to talk with your son about that a little yeah. bit. He's, he's blowing your cover. So. Now, with you being a tax expert, can I rip this off? <laughs> and right <laughs> off the wife's clothes that are in there as well, because yeah. this is our soundproofing. Yeah, yeah. I, we've had a tax practice for all of uh, a couple months, so that okay. makes me an expert. So I'd say do it. David, go yeah. for it. Do it. Do it. So you tax for just a month now? A like, little longer. This past little longer. We just we just launched one this past season. So, so uh, what, what's going on with that? Like, what was the impetus? Like, why did you get? I mean, a lot of people want to get out of tax. Yeah, they yeah. don't. They don't want to. That's why they've been getting into this cloud accounting thing. Let's do the books. Let's let's be the advisors. You're getting into compliance now. We have, we have a totally an acuity at our firm a backwards approach to all this. It's just the way it worked out. We started an advisory like 14 years ago. We added bookkeeping about five or six years ago, and now we just added tax. So I think everyone else is probably smarter than us and goes the other direction. But yeah, we're we're adding the compliance and the lower level pieces of the accounting stack as we go on. So everyone else is going to advisory. We're diversifying from it. So who knows whether that's smart or not? Probably not. Do you think one direction is easier than the other? I do think that yes, it is. I do think the direct. We were very fortunate to start an advisory. That's I think been a little bit easier in some ways. The biggest challenge for us is to keep an open mind and not let ego get in the way. Because when we started, we were fractional CFOs and thinking of doing bookkeeping. Well, let's step back for a moment. Tell us a little bit about your firm, Yeah, uh, where it is now, where you came from. I think people will be very interested to, to hear that in addition to you know all the services you offer. Like, How did you get to this point? So 14 years ago, started in just outsourced or fractional CFO work. And that was my background. I worked with tech startups in Atlanta, Georgia, and I had a just you know a good time talking to other friends who were founders of tech companies. So we'd go out for beers and over lunch, they'd say, hey, Kenji, can you help me on my business model a little bit? Or here's what my funding deck looks like. And so just started doing that on the side. And then another friend of mine joined me. And that was the original vision of Acuity was just to provide outsourced fractional CFO services just for tech startups in Atlanta. And then over time, actually not a lot of time, we added controller services pretty quickly because it's a place I had been as a controller for many years as well, too, was you add a controller. And then we thought it was going to be just controller and CFO fractional services for startups and early stage companies. And that was going to be it. And then um, we kept hearing over and over from clients like, this is great. We love the controller CFO services, but really like the blocking and tackling of bookkeeping is a real problem. Like, in fact... We couldn't get to a lot of our advisory work because someone would hire us to come in and do some big financial model. We'd get in and the underlying bookkeeping and it was garbage. So we couldn't get to a lot of work. And finally, we thought, you know, maybe let's think about doing bookkeeping. Um, And that was a little hard for us, honestly. That's what I meant earlier about the ego thing where we thought, well, wait a minute, I'm a former big four person and I've only been a CFO. Why would I do bookkeeping? And then I think once we heard clients talk about how badly they needed it, and the second piece that really helped us was it was really the emergence of the cloud accounting software. So just the namesake of this podcast, right? So we saw those two kind of converge for us and thought, this may be the time to actually get into bookkeeping. So, so it sounds like, if I may summarize, mm-hmm. uh, that you saw that you, you had the need to do the bookkeeping because garbage in, garbage out. Right. You wanted to control that data. And then the technology is what actually enabled you to do it in a cost-effective Way. Correct. We had a few fits and starts with like, maybe we should just hire a bookkeeper. And, and what we've, our experience was we'd be sending these bookkeepers running around all through Atlanta traffic, which is terrible tra- traffic for those who haven't been there. And it was just a really ineffective means to put people out on sites to go to do deal with desktop software. It just felt like this is a crazy model. There's no way to scale it. So we just, we pulled back a little bit. Once the cloud accounting software started emerging, then we saw, okay, wait a minute, we can maybe go back to this and scale that. So, yeah. And how many people are in your firm now? Uh, We're about 85 employees. Yeah. And last year, you did a really cool presentation on 
what was it called? It was something about building a boiler room. <laughs> building a boiler room. Who wouldn't want their own boiler room? And we did said that kind of tongue in cheek. And, and it's something actually that um, well, Amanda Aguilar and I are doing. And we're going to do some, if anyone wants to sign up to the Elephant, by the way, we're going to talk more about that. Yeah, well, teach, teach how to build your own boiler room. So, so the term has some negative connotations, <laughs> clearly. Uh, I love the movie, The Boiler Room, by yeah. the way. Uh, but what you were teaching us had really powerful real world lessons. And, and it's kind of amazing to me that more firms don't, well, I guess I should step back and say, what, is, what do we mean by boiler room? It's these outbound sales tactics. Correct. Right. So, Correct. so hiring business development representatives straight out of college, pretty much a lot of cases, right? In almost all cases. For all us, cases. Yeah, yeah. And then you, you, uh, they're, they're out there prospecting for you and, and, and trying to get meetings booked, right? That's, yeah. it's like the, the traditional, uh, SAS, uh, business development model applied to uh, an accounting firm. Yeah, and, exactly right. And other and so many firms are just sitting around there waiting for referrals. Yeah, and you're actually out there getting business. So I think the less negative, you know, uh, terminology versus using boiler room, yeah. is really what the way we look at it is. It's a it's learning how to sell without you as the firm firm owner yourself being the one doing it. Like how can how can you sell more as a practice? But you don't have to be the one to be doing all that selling because that's just not a scalable tactic and it's right. not a way to do it. So that's really, yes, you think about creating these boiler rooms is kind of a funny, edgy way to say it, but really what we're trying to do is say, how, how can you as a firm owner build up a sales pipeline and you're not the one actually having to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's good. And, and for, for those listening who are not so familiar with the accounting salon, it, it's become, well, hopefully it will be a tradition this year to, to take a somewhat uh, non-traditional approach to your titles of your presentation. So Absolutely. We have fun with it. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We do. So um, when it comes to you, what, I, what I've noticed about your website is the way you reference your bookkeepers. So you built out your, you, you took that jump to, hey, we're going to have bookkeepers, but you don't really call them bookkeepers. I, and I always forget what the title is, but they're just not a normal bookkeeper name. Right. Or we call them cloud specialists. Yeah. Okay, so, cloud yeah. Specialists. Yep. That was very intentional. And I think... Clients still use bookkeeping. The terminology of bookkeeping gets thrown out a lot, but we felt it important between me and our other leadership team members and our, and our cloud um, specialist team leader to really help give a bit of a different identity to our, our team. You know, yes, they're performing traditional bookkeeping functions, but we think the role needs to emerge and needs to change. And in fact, part of our mission at Acuity is to bring in great bookkeepers and to really help them develop their skill sets, so they can be these, these cloud specialists. They can be advising on different apps. They can become real specialists in all these integrations because what we see at Acuity is that the environment's um, getting more complex um, and clients are using that complexity of all these new solutions to build custom software. I mean, basically a custom accounting function for their own small business, which is unbelievable. I mean, it's truly amazing when you think that historically the only companies that could ever have an actual customized accounting solution was like somebody who's buying Oracle millions of dollars a year and they're doing these huge, massive implementations. Well, now it can happen for smaller businesses, depending on which pieces of software you use. And as long as you go cloud, you've got this huge availability of the app marketplaces. But what you're going to need more of is someone who understands how all these apps work together and how they integrate. So that's what we're trying to prepare our team for and even in using some of the naming of like, hey, we're we view you as cloud specialists. So that's what we're trying to get them to. So there's a million apps out there, yeah. well, hundreds, right? Not millions, but that's a lot. A lot a to lot. know, a lot for your team to know. How do you guys go about creating tech stacks? Do you do it by industry? Do you just sort of do it as you go? Do you, How do you educate your team on all this? A bit of both. Um, we do, like we we just have pretty recently, so if anyone wants to go take a look at how we approach it, you can take a look at our site, acuity.co. Um, we do have a partner kind of page, but if you look at our partner page, it's really our tech stack. And you'll see, I think today we've got about 20 pieces of technology that are our tech stack. And you can kind of resort it a little bit by industry and it'll kind of make some changes, but it's only 20 right now. And that's those are actually 20, though, that we've had to go through a vetting process of us at Acuity saying, okay, we feel like this is a software that we can help support on the integration side. We can work closely with their with, with the developers who built the software. So so yeah, we've taken it. We really view it's instrumental to who we are. So we give them a whole page on our website and talk about hey, here's who our here's who our technology partners are. Um, 
but it's it's actually a fairly lengthy process for us to go through and vet them. We don't just let anybody and say, hey, great, I got this new cloud accounting app. Can I put it on your page? No, we got to make sure you can support it. And is that a fairly new process for you? Because I feel like when I met you guys originally at that time, you had all your processes down to sell your service. And I yeah. think you were like onboarding 30 new, and it's going to be an exaggeration, <laughs> but like 30 new clients a month, right? You're it may just, have happened one month. Okay. But, still use <laughs> okay. Okay. Right. <laughs> but at that time, you didn't have any like, you know, we put some lines of QuickBooks, some at zero. This client might use build.com. We have three different expense apps, three different timesheet apps we use, but it sounds like you've kind of started to standardize across your client base now. We have. We were doing some of that back then. We've been a little more disciplined with it now. Um, so yeah, that's correct, David. We have we have kind of focused a little bit more on what we truly can scale and iterate over and over. And we're usually not going to tell someone if they're on QuickBooks Online or they're on Zero and they're using some app we've never heard of before, we're not going to throw them out. We're not going to say, well, great, we can't support you. Um, but one thing that I think that we've tried to be better about is, yeah, it's great to be a little bit agnostic. We felt ourselves that way. We want to give our clients freedom of choice. I think we were a little, probably last time we talked about this, we were too much in that role to where clients came back and told us, that's great that you're giving us these this freedom and flexibility. Can you just tell us what to use? Like, just give me some direction. I think that I missed that before where, um, well, giving people all this choice in a massive ecosystem is actually not that helpful. It's a little bit more helpful to be, no, no, really curated in this massive ecosystem. That's actually a more helpful strategy. So we're trying to be a little more thoughtful about that as well, too. Sense. Yeah. Obviously, we have lots of listeners and they can learn things from Blake and myself, but what's the one thing they can only learn from Kenji? <laughs> Probably the best way to come and learn from me is to see this, uh, you can learn how to create a very weird hybrid, call it video podcast if you want, uh, maybe how not to do it. But um, we did take actually inspiration from, I say we, it's my business partner, Matthew and I took inspiration from you guys. Um, we love what you do on the Cloud Accounting Podcast. But we thought, what if we try to do a video version of it that's a little bit more unique to us? And so um, something, if you want to come in and see how, how, again, maybe learn a little bit about the do's and don'ts of how to have a video podcast, come check us out. Um, I called Drink While You Think, our YouTube channel. And by the way, if anyone wants to come be on it, you guys are definitely scheduling you guys to come on it. But what, what, is, is it live? Do you do it live? We used to do it live. Okay. We no longer do it live now. We had some problems. <laughs> There's one of those examples of I can teach you what not to do, or at least the way we did it. It's now you can look at earlier episodes that were live. Now you can look at ones that are a little bit okay. more edit, edited. But it's for us, it's a way to, um, as we've said, our only, our only goal with that is that uh, we love to have a drink with our friends and just talk about things in our life. For me and Matthew, it's that we're, that we're dads, we're entrepreneurs, we're in this cloud accounting space, we're big sports fans. So if we, could have a, if we could have a drink with our friends talking about that every single week, then we're happy. And that's the only thing we're trying to do there with that. So, so do your staff watch these videos? Are you, are you worried that this, you guys are just at home hanging out, <laughs> drinking beers and talking on yeah. webcams? Yeah. Like, like, is that par- intentional? Or is that part of the culture? Or? It is absolutely intentional. Well, they, they know this about, they're not surprised by anything that's on there. Yeah. Um, but in fact, it probably does reinforce a bit more of who we are. We're just, we're pretty open, open-minded, pretty open book about things. And in fact, we found that as we've gotten bigger and bigger, you know, 85 employees now, that it's helpful having all kinds of little ways to make sure team members hear what kind of things are in our head. So we're, we're, uh, we don't mind them at all listening to that, but sometimes they find it hilarious when we come in next week and they're laughing about things we said on a... I'm sure that you, for, especially you think about that, you, you have this bigger organization now, and I'm yeah. sure you probably have an employee that gets hired and they probably working for you for six months and you didn't even know they were working for you. You're probably getting to that size, right? We it's are. It's some way for these for you to be relatable to all the employees of your company. And I hadn't thought about that initially, David, but you're right. It is something that, um, and I'm speaking on this at another uh, uh, conference in a few weeks, or actually later this week, about scaling a firm. And that's probably one of the lessons that was hard for me to understand was that there are going to be employees I don't know that I haven't met for six months. There's a whole bunch of clients I've never met. I don't even know their names. And that was, um, I think, what you guys have shown through the medium um, of podcasting. I think other Will Lopez has been good about video. There's still ways to create personal connections without knowing someone face to face, which is awesome that we're doing this here face to face. But this is it's not something that you know probably any of our families would let us do on a regular basis. It's a, it's a combination. You need both, right? You yeah. get that face time. You get that online time. Build relationship. Awesome. So if people want to build a relationship with you, Kenji, online, where can they reach you? 
Uh, the best place to reach me is on Twitter. And that's at just at Kenji Kuramoto. A little tough to spell, but I think you all can figure it out. But at Kenji Kuramoto on Twitter is the best place to reach me. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Kenji, for your time. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Kenji.